So welcome everyone and thanks for attending uh, this meeting. Let someone in. Uh, so as Sarah said, we've got a short presentation just setting out uh, a bit of background detail uh, on the consultation and the project. Uh, and then we'll have a, a description of the two options that we're, we're proposing that are also available uh, online and in the consultation documents. And Andy, my, my colleague Andy from WSP is going to go through in a little bit of detail uh, on those two options. Uh, then I've got a slide just to, to show how you can respond to the consultation. And then, as Sarah said, we'll devote most of the time this evening to a question and answer session. So please feel free to ask any questions that you have. Uh, one or multiple questions. I'm happy to sit here until they're all answered. So just as a, a brief introduction, so the, just setting out this, the kind of the scope of the scheme. So we've been set the task uh, to look at the, the section between uh, Lensfield Road, Gondville Place Junction and Hills Road College, uh, which is Purbeck Road. Uh, and the, the overall aim that we've been set is to make this area kind of more easier and attractive to, to kind of use by walking, cycling and public transport, uh, which we're looking to achieve through kind of changing the way that, that changing the design of the street, the sections, uh, adding various infrastructure at junctions uh, and, and on the side roads and changing some of the bus stops along, along the route. So Basically, the consultation sets out two concept design options for discussion and comment, uh, and some of that discussion can can happen tonight. So one thing I would say is that we've, we've set out the scheme as two, two, two options, but various aspects of each option could be interchangeable in any in any future design outcome. So sorry, I'm just being interrupted. Excuse me. Uh, so option A uh, proposes an end-to-end -end walking and cycling improvements, but it can be mostly built without moving existing curb lines. Uh, and the op option proposes changes to existing junction layouts, less less kind of intensive changes than than in option in option B, but which will improve facilities for both pedestrians and cyclists while broadly maintaining kind of the current vehicle capacities through the junctions. The second option, option B, proposes much more extensive changes to the kind of the road layout. Uh, we're looking to move most of the curb lines to provide much wider cycle lanes along the length of the scheme. Uh, and you'll also see changes to kind of the layout over Hills Road Bridge. Uh, so the, the more ex also included more extensive changes uh, to the to the main junctions especially to Station Road and Cherry Hinton Road, where we've got kind of a Cyclops Junction arrangement, which which Andy will show on the maps as he goes through them. Uh, and these will significantly improve cycling and pedestrian infrastructure around and, and the movements, ability for cyclists and pedestrians to get around and through those junctions, uh, but somewhat at the expense of, uh, obviously if you give slightly more uh, infrastructure to the cyclists pedestrians you take a little bit away from the actual carriageway itself so you, you introduce a little bit of further delay to the junction so andy uh, i'll hand over to andy now who's going to go through the the detailed layouts great thanks paul I'll stop my share yeah i'll just share the plans is that all uh all visible to everyone yep Great. Yeah, evening, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm just going to uh, spend about five, ten minutes talking through the two options so everyone's got a sort of good understanding of what's um, being proposed. So on the screen at the moment is option A. Uh, and we're just starting here at the northern end, which is the Lensfield Road, Gonville Place Junction. So I'll just talk through the kind of key features as we go south down the street. So I guess, the, yeah, the first thing to say really mentioned about this junction is and sort of the overall approach for option A is it's really focusing the improvements on uh, improving the infrastructure for people traveling north south along the street. So for many for cyclists and pedestrians. Uh, so at the Gonville Place Junction, we're looking to uh, introduce um, 
cycle lanes fully up to the junction uh, on Regent Street and Hills Road, whereas at the moment there's uh, gaps in the infrastructure. So that involves some changes to particularly to the Regent Street arm uh, and some guidance for cyclists traveling through the junction north south. So continuing kind of southbound along Hills Road. Um, one of the key principles along this section uh, highlighted by the yellow crossings is we're seeking to retain all the existing pedestrian crossings, so not looking to take any of those away as part of the scheme. You can see from the side roads, so consistently along this section of Hills Road, you've got Harvey Road, St Paul's Road, um, Glisson Road. What we're looking to do here at all of these side roads as part of the proposal is to introduce continuous footway treatments. So that's basically a design where the footway continues across the side road and gives priority to pedestrians crossing the street rather than vehicles turning in and out, out of the side roads. So that's the same along all these sections, all the side roads you see on the scheme. The main feature of option A compared to option B, which we'll move on to shortly, is we're looking to retain uh, the inbound bus lane. So that's highlighted here in blue. That's an existing bus lane. This option retains that from Bateman Street all the way through to Union Road. And what that means is that cyclists share the bus lane with buses and taxis who are permitted to use that facility. And as a consequence of kind of retaining that bus lane, existing curb, la curb lines, the, the cycle lane that's proposed southbound will be slightly narrower than in option B. Just continuing down this section, so in terms of uh, there's a local centre, which you're probably aware of, where you've got like the Tesco's and the co-op around Russell Street, uh, Glisson Road. So to try and manage, better manage uh, servicing and loading activities by uh, HGVs and vans, we're looking to put loading bays on all the side roads. So Harvey Road, St Paul's Road, Glisson Road, to try and encourage um, deliveries to take place on the side roads rather than on Hills Road itself and not interrupt. Uh, the continuous southbound cycle lane and the bus lane. These little highlighted blue uh, sections are where we're looking to introduce uh, brand new on street cycle parking. So one thing that uh, is in demand is uh, cycle parking in the local centre where the shops are. So it's to provide those facilities for people to be able to park their bikes safely and visit the shops. And then just moving on to the station road junction. So the proposals in option A again are focused around providing better north-south cycle lane facilities for uh, cyclists. So the main change here is around the um, outbound lane being reduced down to a single lane and providing that continuous cycle lane up to the junction, whereas at the moment there's a gap in that provision for cyclists traveling out of town. And there's also changes to uh, the pedestrian crossing facilities. So instead of having uh, indirect crossings where you have to cross in two stages, we're looking to provide direct crossings and widen the footways to provide more space on the corners where they're quite under pressure from sort of heavy pedestrian footfall to and from the station. And then continuing southbound, um, this section here just south of Station Road, uh, we've got space here to introduce uh, floating bus stops uh, and a new Toucan crossing, which is part of a, a proposed scheme by a developer who's looking to redevelop the site. Um, just on the uh, just on Hills Road there. And then if we continue south, so through the section past the Botanical Gardens, we're looking to provide the continuous wider cycle lanes. We've got space here to provide um, a wider section of inbound and outbound cycle lane and the floating bus stop uh, in the inbound direction. You can see we're sort of continuing with the continuous footway treatments across the side roads in this section as well. And then if we move through to Brooklyn's Avenue uh, Junction, the main changes proposed at this junction again is bringing the cycle lane all the way through up to the junction, which at the moment there's a gap in that provision, so allowing uh, providing that safe facility for cyclists to get right up to the, the stop line. On Brookgate, um, we're looking to be able to open it up so cyclists can exit in all directions, not just have to turn uh, left out of there like they do at the moment. And on Brooklyn's Avenue, it's uh, a drop curb at the advanced cycle lane stop line facility so cyclists can come off the shared path and uh, access that uh, advanced cycle stop line to then be able to turn um, out of Brooklyn's Avenue. Continuing over the railway bridge, so the there is no real change here, it's about um, 
retaining the existing arrangement, which if you're familiar has these uh, cycle lanes on the curb side as you go up the, the, the ramps and then as you approach each junction, Brooklands Avenue and Cherryington Road, there's a central cycle lane uh, that allows kind of cyclists to continue their journey north and south or join the um, advanced cycle stop line to turn. So this option A retains that existing arrangement. Uh, if we move through to Cherry Hinton Road Junction, um, there's relatively minor changes as part of option A at this junction. So we're looking to introduce a direct pedestrian crossing across Homerton Street, whereas at the moment that's done in two stages. So kind of improving that north-south pedestrian movement, uh, providing uh, guidance for cyclists traveling through the junction. Uh, and then as we continue south uh, along Hills Road, the main change in this section is removing this current inbound short section of bus lane that's there on the street at the moment and reallocating that space to provide a continuous inbound cycle lane that ties into the existing uh, cycle lanes on Hills Road and then providing that continuous uh, southbound cycle lane and upgrading the existing bus stops to floating bus stop arrangements. And then just to uh, improve access into Purbeck Road, which is a, a main cycle route to Hills Road College. Um, there'll be like a, a small kind of facility here for cyclists to be able to exit the cycle lane and, and wait to turn right into um, and Purbeck Road as well. And just to say, in terms of the infrastructure standard, um, we're looking to provide a Cambridge curbed uh, cycle lane throughout the scheme and uh, that's basically ties in with the existing Cambridge Curb Hills Road cycle lanes that go up towards uh, Adam Brooks. Okay, so that's option A. So I'm just going to talk through option B and just point out the main differences. So option B is Paul set out it's a bit more uh, transformational in terms of the scale of the infrastructure changes. So um, similar design for Lensfield Road Junction. Um, so again, looking to bring the, the cycle lanes right up to the junction uh, on Regent Street, so same as option A. But the main difference here, as you can see in this section, is we've removed uh, the bus lane. So option A is the inbound bus lane. That road space has been reallocated to provide two much wider cycle lanes throughout this section. So that's one of the key differences between option A and option B is uh, retention of the bus lane in option A or in option B is there a preference to replace the bus lane with better quality cycle infrastructure in both directions? By removing the bus lane, it gives us more space to provide floating bus stops in this section, which in option A, we didn't have the space to do that. So there's a better uh, upgrade in terms of bus infrastructure through here. And then the treatment of the side roads is the same throughout the section. So it's the introduction of continuous footways throughout this section of Hills Road. Uh, the provision of loading bays on the side road. And because the bus lane's uh, been reallocated to cycle lane, there's also, as part of this uh, option, a time limited loading bay. Um, it's currently shown in the local centre to just provide some facilities for uh, HDVs, vans to service the shops on this side of the street from a loading bay here that would only be usable during off peak periods, but that would sit, have to sit within the cycle lane. Same as option A, we're providing um, on-street additional cycle parking in the retail centre. And then these wider cycle lanes continue all the way through to Station Road and upgrading all the bus stops in this section to floating bus stop arrangements. You can see at Station Road there's a bit more of a transformational proposal. So it's a kind of hybrid cyclops arrangement. So you've got the continuous cycle tracks for people travelling north and south on Hills Road through the junction completely segregated from the traffic lanes and also the ability for cyclists to turn out of Station Road uh, using the cycle tracks to turn right uh, and left without having to mix with traffic. And then the yellow marks the uh, the, the, uh, the direct pedestrian crossings for pedestrians. And the fact that the junction is more compact yeah. provides a lot more space for pedestrians around the junction uh, in terms of coming to and from Station Road. There's also a facility here which will be signal control for cyclists who want to travel right into Station Road from Hills Road would be able to do that with their own kind of traffic signal controlled uh, movement as well. And then continuing south from Station Road, this section is very much the same as option A, so it's wide cycle hybrid, uh, sorry, Cambridge curb cycle lanes in both directions with the upgraded floating bus stop. 
At the Brooklands Avenue Junction, uh, slightly more transformational changes compared to option A, so looking to bring the cycle lanes again through to uh, the stop lines. Brookgate is opened up for cyclists to exit in all directions. And then on Brooklands Avenue, it's about introducing a uh, dedicated on-street cycle lane that feeds uh, advanced cycle stop lanes. So rather than relying on the shared use path, there'll be a, a section of cycle lane on Brooklands Avenue to improve that for cyclists as well. The main difference here on the bridge is that we've removed the existing uh, bridge layout and replaced it with two uh, continuous curbside cycle lanes, which are much wider. And as a consequence of that, it requires a change to the, um, the junction approach to Brooklands Avenue. So this is called a hold the left turn arrangement. So it basically cyclists come through on the near side and then they get to a, a green light to move ahead of the traffic before any um, turning traffic um, turns into Brooks Avenue so those kind of that conflict is designed out of the junction. And then moving through to uh, Cherry Hinton Road Homerton Street so the design with the near side curbside wider cycle lanes that would feed straight into a full cyclops design for Homerton Street which is similar to the scheme that's gone in on Histon Road at Gilbert Road so it's fully segregated pedestrian crossings, fully segregated cycle tracks for all movements. So basically a full cyclops design at that junction that segregates, well, segregates space for all the users. And then continuing south through to um, Purbeck Road, we've got wide, the continuation of the wide Cambridge curb cycle tracks, existing crossings are retained, bus stops are upgraded to floating bus stops. And then here we've provided a bit more of a transformational change in terms of that access into Hills Road College. So cyclists can use the cycle lanes. They're able to peel off at a Toucan crossing. And then there's a short section of two way cycle track for cyclists to access Purbeck Road, completely segregated from kind of uh, the general traffic there as well. So that's a quick canter through the two schemes in terms of the key features and the designs that we're consulting on. Um, and then I think, yeah, back to you, Paul, really to next part of the presentation. OK, thanks, Andy. We can come back to any of these maps uh, following this last slide. So the last slide I just wanted to set out on screen, uh, basically some of the links as to how you can tell us your views. So these are all these are all in the online brochure as well, but uh, you can find all of that information at this link here, which is www.greatercambridge.org.uk slash cycling dash plus dash Hills Road. Uh, and there's your email uh, or you can also write to us. Uh, I just wanted to point out we have an, a drop in so live event uh, from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. on Wednesday the 5th. Uh, at Cambridge Junction. So if you want to come and actually speak to us in person, we'll all be there, uh, which in some ways is slightly better than than uh, talking on Teams. Uh, and then we've got a final online event uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. Thursday the 13th of July. Uh, if you know anyone else who, who can't get to the junction but wants to kind of speak to us. Uh, and just to say the consultation closes at midday uh, on the 24th of July. So I'm going to hand back to Sarah now and Sarah is going to kind of chair and manage the question and answer se uh, session. Thank you very much, Paul, and thank you, Andy, for your presentation. So, yes, as Paul says, the uh, the Q&A is now open. We've had a few questions and comments in the chat, which I'll start to go through. Um, and if anybody else would like to add, either post in the chat or you're very welcome to uh, raise your hand and we'll answer your question in, in virtual life, so to speak. So the first question is from Finley Paul um, about continuous footways. Is the plan to have a uniform surface treatment from the main pavement across the junction? Having too much of a contrasting surface can make the priorities a little unclear. I'm happy to explain any of that stuff, by the way, if I need to elaborate on my wafflings. No, I'll pass that over to Andy to to elaborate on, to answer. I think if that's all right. Yeah, no, that's fine. I think um, Finney, we're 
like quite a concept design. So it's more about setting the principles of the design at a stage. So it's the principle would be it'd be a continuous footway treatment. But I think yeah, at the detailed design stage, we need to get into how that's actually going to look. You know, what is going to be the surface treatment for that? So um, it's something. Yeah, definitely we can we will be considering as we move into that next um, design stage. Um, but I don't have a definitive answer of exactly what that's going to look like at this point. No, so I agree with Andy there. So uh, obviously different locations uh, warrant slightly different, you know, designs. But I would, what I would say is that the picture that you put up in the chat is something that I also think is a good design. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah so, so you're kind of so, probably on the same page, you know. Okay. Yeah, there's there's an interesting one where the the design I put up there is, I think it, the the illustration is that because you have those two different surfaces, when people walk out, it tends to be a, is this a different part of the pavement? And, and there might be some some schools of thought which say it's good to have some contrast because there might be a car coming across, and other schools of thought which say making it look as much like the same pavement as before yeah. is good for. Uh, you know, making it very clear for anyone in the car that that is a pavement, so it slows down. Um, and I know there's like all the precast concrete Dutch entry curves and stuff, but that is getting far too technical for this. So, <laughs> but good, yeah, okay, concept at this stage, but yeah, it's important to note again. these these points of detail though that we need to pick up going forward for me. So yeah, that's helpful. I'll, I'll be a nerd about it. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your question. Could I just ask everyone to be? keep themselves on mute please when they're not speaking there's just a little bit of background noise every now and then thank you very much uh janet has a raised hand would you like to ask your question janet uh, thank you <clears throat> i've got two questions actually <clears throat> sorry um the first is about a, a a floating bus stop outside um hills road sixth form college and i wonder if anyone has um been at the sixth form college um, at the morning um, when the students are going in and uh, in the afternoon when they're coming out and looked at the numbers wanting to get on the bus to work out whether it will actually be safe to have a floating bus stop um, or whether it would be overcrowded with um, with uh, too many people. So that's that's my first question. Um, and my second question is about um, continuous um, pathways, pedestrian ways. Um, uh, I own a flat in High Set on Hills Road, and currently my daughter lives there. So when I visit her, and um, I have to go by car because I have limited um, mobility. Um, when I um, seek to turn into High Set, there are always people walking along um, the pavement, uh, nearly always. And of course, uh, you, in turning left, you hold up the traffic behind you. So, um, and particularly if your plans are going to make uh, just a single lane on each side of, of the road, there's the chance. Uh, that are actually going to delay the public transport um, because of the needs of cars to turn out of and into the roads, then being held up by pedestrians and cyclists. So I wonder how much you've looked into um, how it will all affect the traffic flow. Thanks. Thanks for your question so, uh, and points. So your first point about the floating bus stops uh, near, near Hills Road College, I think that that is a valid, very valid consideration, and something that we're going to need to. Well, is a good thing to raise at this this point in consultation. Uh, you know, in, in response to the concepts we put out, uh, we need to weigh up whether you know the scenario that happens on that section of road, kind of at, at college start time and, and end time, and probably at lunch time as well, somewhat. Uh, makes makes it makes it kind of the, the floating bus stop arrangement kind of not particularly safe or or actually is the floating bus stop okay to have there albeit at that those particular times of day you know it's going to be a bit congested but all the rest of the 
kind of the day it's going to be a, a decent piece of infrastructure that cyclists can use to kind of avoid the buses and not have to like swing out into the carriageway so there's kind of that consideration to make and i think you know one of the challenges that andy and his team are going to have in the next stage is to kind of assess that and and work out with what, what is the best option for the bus stops in that location but it's kind of something that's been already raised a couple of times when we've spoken to people about the concepts uh, and i think it's a really a valid point that we need to kind of think about so that's that that would be my answer to that my answer to the second point is that currently the highway code states that if, if a pedestrian is crossing a side road the vehicle should give way whether or not you have a continuous crossing. So in reality, if there is a pedestrian you know, about to cross, uh, the, the car has, should, should be giving way anyway. What we're doing by putting the uh, continuous footways is kind of trying to help to emphasize, emphasize what is already written in the highway code and to kind of point out to, dri to drivers, you know, who, had that, who actually does have the priority. I don't know, Andy, if you want to go any further on that or? No, I think I just agree with what you said there, Paul. I think the very much the um, the ethos behind the design is 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 designing infrastructure in that kind of modal priority. So pedestrians at the top, then it's cyclists, public transport, cars. So we really need to focus on what is the infrastructure needed at the top of the pyramid in terms of for pedestrians so that they can very much safely walk up and down hills road we need to remember this is a very um, popular walking route uh, not only for um, to schools to shops into Cambridge from the station so there is a you know quite a heavy pedestrian footfall along here and we need to um, yeah one of the key things we're looking to do is provide that safer infrastructure for pedestrians traveling north and south up the street and they are uh, sort of top of the, the the modal hierarchy when it comes to street design um, as set out in manual for streets Great, thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Um, I'll go through another few questions in the chat and then Janet Huskinson, I'll come to you. I can see you've got your hand up. So uh, another question from Finley. He's asking about a longer term ambition to pedestrianise Regent Street and how do the Hills Road Cycling Club plans fit in with that? Do you have an answer to that? Otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'll step in. So in terms of longer term plans for Regent Street, so it's unclear exactly what is going to happen along there at the moment. So we are currently designing. So our concept designs currently take into account what infrastructure that we think could go in now and, and would work in the current situation. Albeit that we do have a an eye on kind of you know what might be coming in the future so we're kind of taking that into account in the background but essentially we want to design infrastructure that can go in in the, in the current time because no one can tell us no no one knows exactly how things are going to pan out in the future and you know what other infrastructure is you know going to go in in the future i mean it, that infrastructure relies on future funding and, and a whole load of different things so it may or may not come uh, so that's kind of our design brief and kind of the way that we are looking at this. Uh, it's also partly one of the reasons that we haven't uh, fully addressed that junction at Gonville Place, Lensfield Road. So if you look at the designs, we've kind of uh, brought the cycling infrastructure up to that junction, but we're not proposing to, to radically change that junction, because, partly because we don't yet know exactly kind of you know what's what's going to happen on on Regent Street and kind of the surrounding areas yeah that makes sense no thanks for the explanation I, I guess it's my kind of follow-on assuming that was I kind of thought that might be the answer so um one thing that I've obviously we've seen around quite a lot of Cambridge is the semi-permanent slash temporary bollard based scheme so I'm thinking of on um up near uh Anglia Ruskin those sorts of uh, bollard schemes along there is there I wonder if there's any scope for kind of medium term using those sorts of semi permanent infrastructures to kind of build out mock junction design. So you could do something like create effectively a fake cyclops or fake dot roundabout, whatever, using semi permanent methods. It, I'm just thinking if if the 
intermediate time scales are a bit uncertain for this, whether you could kind of do something say, quick and cheap, but somewhat experimental to inform just kind of the thought that comes to mind if we're talking about uncertainty going forward. It's quite tricky. Have you been to Station Road Junction? It's a complete mess at the moment. Oh yeah, North so. Station Road, God no, not that one. That one I like option B, great. I was thinking more the top of Regent Street where you've got that kind of very large open area of tarmac and whether you can kind of take lanes out with bolt down curbs and bollards and that sort of uh, iterative improvement there. So we haven't particularly thought about, the, we're not really focused on doing that at the moment at this stage. We're kind of, okay. yeah, no, no, I would say no at the moment, but, you know, put the idea out there. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Finley. Yes. Uh, so B Jacoby says uh, the plans are great, but is repairing all the potholes included? Andy, is this one for you? Um, yeah, I can, I can pick this up. I think, yeah, there's um, there's an element of overlap. So obviously there's, you know, maintenance currently falls to the county council, but we are aware that sections of Hills Road are in um, relatively poor condition at the moment. And so when, as part of sort of a comprehensive scheme, we wouldn't want that to be um, the case going forward. So I think, yeah, as part of, part of looking at the scheme in more detail, we're going to have to identify where there are sort of, um, issues with the existing infrastructure in terms of potholes and um, problems with the structure and investigate them more fully and then discuss it with GCP and other stakeholders of how we address those as part of a comprehensive improvement to this section of Hills Road. OK, so it will be part of the plan then? Um, yeah, it's definitely a plan that we're going to have to go out and look at where all these defects are and then we're going to have to discuss you know, as we develop this scheme and discuss it with stakeholders like the County Council, and decide how we address those issues going forward as part of a, a comprehensive improvement to the section of Hills Road. OK, thank you. I'm happy uh, to hear that. I think uh, from my from my perspective, uh, I'm not going to make any promises on this one because the budget is slightly lower than some of the other schemes I've look, look, looked after in, in the past, Histon Road and Milton Road. But for Histon Road, for example, we resurfaced everything uh, basically working along, you know, we, there, were, there was a plan in place uh, with the County Council that the GCP scheme would fully address all of the existing maintenance issues, which, you know, the, the road was falling apart, basically. And as we as we built the scheme, we would fully resurface all of the footpaths and all of the carriageway, which we did. Uh, and the same applies for Milton Road, which is also falling apart drastically in some places. Uh, that will all be resurfaced uh, everywhere. With this scheme, my budget is slightly lower. I would like to resurface everything is my first you know, starting point. But what we I think what we'll end up doing is the sections that need it will try and work with the County Council to, to get something in place. And if there isn't the budget to do it within the scheme, uh, then I'll be pushing the County Council quite hard to kind of try and maybe get some of their maintenance budget or tie up with their maintenance uh, to, to, to kind of try and address some, any issues that, that kind of are there. But on certain areas like the junctions, like where we're completely redeveloping a junction, then we, of course, we'll, we, we'll have to kind of resurface those areas anyway. So, OK, I mean, I just think it needs a holistic solution. Um, whereby you know repairing potholes is part of the overall plan because I just think spending money on other things and leaving the surface like it is now isn't a great way to spend money. No, I mean we would look to look to leave it in a in a good in a, you know in a much better condition, and if possible okay. we'd you know resurface where we need to. So that that's my kind of starting point. But I I have to say that there is a budget for this scheme, and I, you know I've got to try and stick to it. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so a comment from Mark Taylor in the chat. Uh, he objects to saying that floating bus stops um, are an upgrade uh, because they're a change to a design challenging for visually impaired people. So that's a, a comment to, uh, to feed in. Um, and I'll come to Janet Huskinson, who's been waiting very patiently. And then Mike Abs has his hand up. So I'll come to you next, Mike. OK, um, I'd like to ask for some more details about these loading bays that you're proposing at the end of what are um, really primarily residential 
um, streets of Hills Road near the shops. Um, I live in Norwich Street and I'm here primarily as a pedestrian. So I'm very interested to hear how that's going to work. Do you envisage, for instance, that they will be, um, uh, you'll people will be, uh, vans and lorries will be having to book spaces or will they be circulating, uh, circulating around trying to find a space at the end of these roads? Will they all be accessing, uh, for instance, Norwich Street um, from um, Hills Road or will they have to trail around through the residential area? And how's it going to be for pedestrians who are walking up to do their shopping at the co-op? and Tesco's, will they have to juggle the pavement with um, trolleys of goods and things? So I just wondered if you could fill me in with some of those details, please. Um, Paul, you're on mute. Am I on mute? No, oh, no we mute. heard you, Janet. Just, Andy, oh, have, you got the, have, you, have you got the plan, maybe, just to bring up? Yeah, sure, Paul. Whilst Andy's doing that, um, we'll come yeah. to Mike Abs next, and then after that, we'll come to Robert Sanson. Because Robert, your uh, your question is next in the chat, but it might be what you're about to ask, and I don't want to preempt it. So uh, you'll be after Mike. Yes. Hello. <laughs> oh, sorry. Mike, we just it'll be just that um, Andy and Paul answer Janet's question, sorry. and then I'll okay. come to you. Thank you. So in terms of the loading bays, obviously the primary aim is to, to try and stop loading on, on Hills Road, which currently happens and kind of blocks both the bus lane and the, the cycle lanes. Uh, we understand that the, the various different streets have got different uh, priorities in terms of direction priorities in some cases. So in some cases that Andy, Andy will probably be better to, to explain this than me, but to, I'm going to hand over to you, Andy, because you understand <laughs> the direction. Yeah, and so, you. yeah, Janet, I mean, it's basically what the, the purpose behind the loading bays on the sideways, as Paul explained, is to provide a facility that enables loading to not have to take place on Hills Road, mm -hmm. because at the moment it impacts on cyclist safety in particular with blocking the cycle lanes. So the loading bays, they could be time limited. So, for example, they could be, um, we could have them available all, all the time or just restricted to certain times. But it's kind of a bit of a balancing act, really. It's like we're trying to provide, you know, a very safe route for pedestrian cyclists on Hills Road. And as a consequence of that, we still need to provide um, a dedicated space for servicing somewhere. Uh, and the main opportunity really is to provide um, these dedicated loading bays on the side roads as close to the, the, the retail centre, which is where they're needed. And it's there to accommodate those kind of deliveries to the shops. So, you know, the food deliveries mm. and um, regular deliveries. So it'll be used by kind of a combination of vans and HGVs. But you are right, the, the vehicles would have to then route uh, back round through the, the, the streets to rejoin Hills Road. Um, so but that is the... Sorry. Yes, in, in Norwich Street particularly, we've just been, as you may know, um, as a result of the rearrangement of the traffic system in Newtown, it's just been made a sort of low traffic impact so um, area, so that any vans that were wanting to uh, load in Norwich Street without turning off Hills Road would have to go all the way down Bateman Street into Panton Street and then down Norwich Street, where currently there's parking on two sides in the middle, and it's not possible to get large vans down. So as long as people realise all this, and we're not, uh, and uh, yeah, but what about pedestrians who are walking along the pavement uh, with all these trolleys being carried up to the co-op? That seems to me to be another consideration because it doesn't actually fulfill your aim of making the pavements more pleasant to work walk down no, I, think. I mean it's a situation that happens at the I moment just, um, yeah okay fair yeah. enough I'll leave it no, there, I was just gonna say okay. yeah Janet sorry I didn't mean to interrupt you but yeah it's a situation that happens at the moment I think given that um, a lot of the loading happens um, outside peak times it tends to not conflict that much with the sort of peak pedestrian flow times but 
yeah, unfortunately, it's something that just has to be managed uh, and trying to um, yeah accommodate in the best we can within the constraints of the street. Um, unfortunately, all these shops along here, they don't have their own off street uh, loading bays or facilities, so that it does have to be accommodated on street. And it's trying to find the best balance for all the competing demands through this section. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thank you for your uh, question, Janet. Mike, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, two, two questions. Uh, the first one is with regard to the through way for pedestrians and cyclists, you know, that's fine. And I know what the highway code says, but what worries me, particularly in the winter time, for traffic coming off the side roads, joining into Hills Road, and if you've got cyclists with dark clothing, no lights, and they just think, and technically they have got the right just to steam through. And I can see many, many accidents happening because just uh, motorists coming on the entails road won't see uh, the, the oncoming cyclists. Now, I don't know what the answer is, but it is a problem and it's a very real one. Um, so that's question one. Question two, um, on your set plan B, um, you, you're turning one of the roundabouts into what really is a, a copy of the Dutch roundabout on Fenden Road. Now, has there been any real survey of the use of the Fenden Road so-called Dutch roundabout? Because, uh, I mean, I know cyclists now who deliberately avoid it because they don't see it as a safe way at all. They, they actually avoid that roundabout. You've got other cyclists and, and pedestrians who just go on any particular track and even the main vehicular track in the center. It, there needs to be a thorough survey on how that roundabout is working because it, it is really a bit of a mess. So it just to just to clarify, we don't have the Dutch style roundabout on this particular scheme. So the design that Andy showed was a cyclops junction, which is if you want to see one in Cambridge, there is one on Histon Road, uh, Histon Gilbert Warwick Road junction. So that works slightly different to a, a Dutch style roundabout in that it's a signalised crossroads, oh, but with okay. their cycling and walking crossings around the outside of the junction. Oh. Do, you want to, okay. do you want to just bring it up, Andy? Yeah, sure. There we go. So you can see see there it's kind of more of a crossroads. So it doesn't have the, the roundabout island in the middle and it functions as a signalised crossroads still. Uh, but the each each arm has its own pedestrian crossing in yellow uh, and cycle crossing obviously in pink. Uh, that's uh, also signal control and part of the overall uh, signal control of the junction. OK. Thanks, Paul. Uh, do you want to take the question about cyclists going across uh, side roads as well? Or is that for Andy? I don't know what I can really say about that. I mean, it's uh, cyclists and pedestrians have priority across side roads currently. Uh, and but the current situation is there are cycle lanes on Hills Road. So, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I don't it know really how to answer that. No, well, there, there aren't any magic answers, are there? But that it, it's a well, potential problem, I think, in the well, winter time. What I would say, though, is that, yeah, with the continuous crossing, I said it earlier, that it, it basically sets out it, it helps to clarify who has the priority across across the side road. In terms of pedestrians, cyclists, I would say, already have the, the priority and uh, they should be using their lights. Otherwise, of course, cyclists are no lights at any time of the year when it's dark are a hazard. One thing I will add to, to that is that everyone else. Thank you very much. There's good street lighting. There's good street lighting down this whole area. So, like, just go slowly and watch out. I mean, there's not evidence that these sorts of side roads kill loads of people. And it's very easy to go kind of get really worried about what could happen. But these things are used universally in a lot of European countries and they don't cause carnage. 
and this is in countries like Netherlands where everyone's riding around on like normal clothes on not high vis not with super high bright lights on and it works absolutely fine so there's a lot of evidence from around Europe that this stuff just is not dangerous and is if anything a lot safer than what we currently have we're kind of really behind on a lot of this in this country but there's evidence so you know we don't need to conduct surveys or do any of that sort of stuff you can just go well look it's been done there's a huge amount of test data for over the past four decades that this stuff is just good so i wouldn't worry too much about it <laughs> that, that's true that, so I, I agree in terms of the actual infrastructure itself uh it's been tried and tested in europe but that the, the so there is a slight difference and i i mean you probably see from my surname that i'm half dutch so i sp speak to my dad occasionally uh about this kind of about my job and one thing that he he would say is that the the kind of it, you've also got the psychology and the mentality of, of people and it's slightly different here than it is in the Netherlands so we do have to think about that that you know people are used to driving and moving around in a slightly different way in the UK to, to, to other countries in Europe but as Finley says yeah the infrastructure itself is tried and tested in a lot of places and we're kind of trying to introduce some of what we think will work and and what is good into kind of this country as well uh and in in many areas you know it, it's been introduced and it and it works well but obviously we need to monitor and make sure that it is working and that it is safe uh but you've got to get it in before you can start monitoring it uh and you know we're, we're trying to kind of bring in things that we think will make the environment safer and and better better for everyone really uh it's not just better for pedestrian cyclists i mean i I, I ride a bike, I walk, but I also drive a car and having better cycling infrastructure means that kind of drivers also have, you know, cyclists don't always, you know, not in the way and are kind of using their own infrastructure and you have to still watch out, but it kind of benefits everyone. Thank you very much and thanks for the question, Mike. Uh, Robert, you've been waiting very patiently. Would you like to ask your question? You're on mute, Robert. We've all done it. <laughs> you thought by all these, after all this mute Zooms and Teams, it would no different. Anyhow, sorry, my question is the same as in the chat, which let me just first say thank you for putting the scheme ahead. I think there are a lot of good things about the options you put forward. So thank you for doing that. Looks, looks good. I just wanted to, my question was about the Brooklands Avenue Hills Road Junction. And it's particular, I, I guess, I, I don't know, I assume you are familiar with what it used to be like 15 or 20 years ago when there were four lanes of motor vehicle traffic over the bridge there. And then we got that cut down to the current three lanes at each end. So beforehand, there was a very, there was a narrow left turn, so narrow cycle lane on the left side as you went north on Hills Road before you got to Brooklands Avenue. And you had to wait for the left turning vehicles going into Brooklands Avenue. And you used to have to wait a long time before going north on Hills Road. So a lot of cyclists, just ignored that and went into the vehicle lane, crossed the left turning traffic lane and moved into the right right hand vehicle lane. So I, I guess I feel in option B, we're kind of at the risk of going back to that. Um, so obviously things, I wonder if you've thought about that, whether there's things that you can mitigate that by changing the signal holding times or the sequence of signals, or the other option is obviously to look at a full Cyclops junction at that junction as well as the other as well as the south end of the hills road bridge so that's that's my questions okay i'm going to let andy answer some of this in a minute but, uh, so i would say that we have looked at a full cyclops junction at this junction uh, sorry a full cyclops uh, at this junction and yeah, you can just it's it's really tight to fit it okay. in and andy will probably explain why uh it's also, okay. as, you, as you mentioned, it's quite an odd geometry, so it works on, on some of the angles, but not on, on some of the others. So it's, it's just a bit of a strange shape when you when you try and put it, fit it in there. So it, we kind of assessed it and we decided that at this stage we, we weren't going to bring it into this consultation. But a few people have, have kind of raised as to you know why we haven't. So, I mean, we we can go back and look at that again once we've you know completed the consultation and and heard what people have said uh i'm going to hand over to andy now to answer a bit more about the kind of the lane whips and and that kind of thing and you might want to talk about the hold of the left and 
Hold on the left, is that what it's called? Sorry. Yeah. Hold the left. No. Yes, that's sure. what it used to be like, and everyone hated it, to be honest. <laughs> no, hi, Robert. Um, yeah, as Paul mentioned, we 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 did look at, as part of the early optioneering, a, a full Cyclops uh, junction arrangement at Brooklyn's Avenue. Um, it is extremely tight, and I think we took the decision that we couldn't quite get a good enough standard junction in there within the available public highway land. Um, we were reliant on some areas of private land, and even with that, it's still it's going to be a challenge to fit in a good standard of okay. Cyclops junction. Okay. So it's something we have looked at, but we have unfortunately ruled okay. it out Thank of this junction that. due to land constraints. Um, and then just on the second point about the hold left turn, I guess, again, it's kind of a balance. So by changing the design of Hills Road Bridge and pushing the cycle lanes to the curbside to remove that kind of central cycle lane conflict, we do then have to do something um, at the Hills Road approach to Brooklyn's Avenue because we do we don't want there's a there is a heavy left turn of vehicle flow from Hills Road into Brooklyn's Avenue, and we just don't want that conflict with cyclists going northbound towards Cambridge. And the only way to really remove that with this design is to have to reintroduce that hold to left turn arrangement, where you physically signalise. Um, different stages so cyclists would only be able to go northbound across that junction as you said when the traffic is held and then that does potentially introduce like you said that level of frustration if they're held for a long time and they're seeing that the traffic's getting to go across but they're having to hold on hold on a red um well, i think the solution to that surely is to let the cyclists go north at the same time as the cars go north and hold the left turn vehicles yes yeah, so they, they can obviously have a longer phase of turning left because they can also turn left when the Brook, when Brooklyn's is exiting. So that's the key thing is looking at this in more detail about kind of how it would work in terms of delay and cycle times. But yeah, you potentially could signalise it so as vehicles are travelling uh, northbound, you could have the cyclists going through northbound as well. So try and get them running together. But yeah, we need to if it's the scheme that gets kind of uh, the most support, we can yeah delve into the more detail of how that would work in terms of the staging, the cycling, and look at whether there'd be sort of unacceptable levels of delay and frustration to cyclists that they would be discouraged yeah, from using. Right. And we don't want to make it more dangerous for cyclists by pushing them in, by getting a lot of people in the Just, open. Yeah, not using it because having to wait. Well, yeah, so that would be kind of going back to what we had before. I don't know if you looked at the discussions from then, but that was, yeah. Yeah, so it's, uh, I mean, it's a tried and tested design, but it's again, it's, it's understanding whether it would work in this context and getting to that next level of detail about, yeah, how long cyclists would have to wait. Is that too long? Can it work with a, with giving cyclists a good green time, particularly for those travelling north? But yeah, what the principle behind the design is very much removing that conflict between vehicles turning left and having to cut across cyclists going northbound. And you think the current design with the the, lane, the central lane is 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 um is, is that's, that's, our, that's our option a. So of, we've, we've still got that yeah. as our option a so okay. as i mentioned before the, the the various aspects of the scheme are interchangeable so in okay. theory right. you could you could implement the cyclops junction at the other side of the bridge what i was going to ask is is whether there's any do you have any accident evidence or any evidence about safety or lack of safety of the current design that's what I always wanted to ask. Uh, we, 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 we do, but we don't not not at this. We, we could we could delve into that after the right. meeting and, and come back to you, but not at this minute in okay. time. Right. Uh, thank you for pointing out that, that you can pick part from option A and part from option B. So that, yeah. So, so what we wanted part of what we wanted to get from this consultation is kind of what yeah we we left kind of it one option as, as kind of it is at the moment because we wanted to get people's views on you know actually does it work really well for them uh or or do you or do they think that actually you know it needs changing so i think we're open to that on the, on the bridge and we also realized that the bridge wasn't was 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 kind of changed not so long ago as well so the actual uh kind of infrastructure on the bridge is relatively new Great, thank you very much for your question, Robert. Uh, we've okay. got quite a lot of activity in the chat, so I'll come to some of the people who haven't yet had a question asked, and then I will come back to some of those that have already asked a question. So I'm not being rude, I have seen you, I just want to make sure that everybody has a chance to have their question answered. So um, this is more a comment from, from David from Living Streets. He says, they remain worried about facilities for blind and partially sighted people 
floating bus stops and cyclops junctions present real challenge there against two stage crossings in every case. Uh, central islands get dangerously crowded at some time of day and people chance the traffic to cross faster. So that's a comment from Living Streets there. Um, Catherine uh, Mitchell says surfaces of cycleways are terrible at present. Um, I think that probably kind of fits in with what you were saying before about potholes and resurfacing and what we may or may not be able to do. But I believe that the uh, any cycleways would be kind of newly laid and would be a nicer experience for cyclists um, who, who use them. Um, got. Catherine also says that schemes are making it increasingly difficult to leave the city by car, shrinking roads and lengthening jams, how to address this. That's what the uh, what the GCP is trying to kind of do overall is to try and make it easier for people to get around the city. Um, Shall we answer that one, Sarah? Yes, please do. Uh, I, I, I trust that uh, it means by vehicle. So obviously the schemes are, are looking at making the city much more accessible, but on foot or by uh, cycle. Uh, so there, there are, as I mentioned right at the start, there are some key differences between a, option A and option B. And while we'll, we will model option, we'll, we'll model both options. Or we have, we haven't quite done that yet, have we, Andy? But both both options are, will be modelled, and we will assess the impacts of whatever we uh, eventually end up with uh, recommending. Uh, as kind of a preferred option, but we 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 do consider the impact that that our designs have on traffic, and the intention is not to completely jam this area up. What, what we want is kind of to reach a balance where we provide better infrastructure for walking, cycling, but we also make sure that kind of you know the carriageway flows, and that's important because public transport also uses the, the carriageway. So we've got to ensure that we, we're not just kind of creating a massive jam everywhere. Thank you. Uh, so that kind of goes with a question from Janet Scott. Uh, if cars going south cannot go into the cycle lane, how will emergency vehicles get through? So, we've, so what we're proposing uh, for both options, in fact, is to utilise Cambridge Curb which is a very low curb, uh, which separates the cycle lane from the carriageway and introduces a very small 25 millimetre height difference between the two. Uh, and if necessary, as on the rest of Hills Road, uh, traffic cars, vehicles can pull over onto that cycle lane uh, and let emergency vehicles through, obviously with care that they don't wipe out cyclists who are using the cycle lane but that's a similar scenario that, that already occurs on Hills Road the rest of Hills Road. <clears throat> if I could comment uh, it seems to be narrowing the space for vehicles and Hills Road does have a lot of emergency vehicles particularly ambulances going through to Adam Brooks um, you know so uh, it really is important that that there is a space for them to get through Yeah, so there would, Andy, just you can verify that there would be the, still the space. Yeah, no, that, that's definitely the case, um, Janet. So most of the uh, hills are at the moment in single carriageway anyway for vehicles. And as Paul explained, the, the vehicles will have that ability to be able to pull over into the cycle lane safely, just um, driving up the, the sloped uh, low curb so there won't be any damage to the vehicles. They can just pull out the way and let those emergency, emergency vehicles come through. Great, thank you very much. So uh, I will return to Finley now, who has some further questions. Um, he says, why are the major junctions not all Cyclops junctions in option B? Done that one. Done that one? <laughs> right out. <laughs> yes, uh, although I can, I can bolt on to um, Robert's comments about the um, Brookgate Avenue, which have the combination of things. Brookgate Avenue. Yeah. yeah, those ones. Um, so... Is there just is there a particular reason why it's got to be three lanes on? Because I mean, it's been knocked down from four to three by the sounds of it in the past. Could it go from three to two, or is that kind of a it will clog up the whole of Cambridge sort of problem? Because if you took it down from three to two lanes, does that give you more space for you know cycling and pedestrian infrastructure? 
So uh, I can answer that for certain on the outbound side of the road. So on the outbound coming out of the centre, we've got three lanes. One is a right turn lane to enable traffic to turn right into Brooklands Avenue, and the other is the ahead lane. So if if we if we reverted that back down to two lanes, all of the ahead traffic would be held caught behind uh, right turning traffic in essentially you would have to run uh, both the inbound and the outbound in two phases separate phases so that adds a lot of delay into the junction so it is a question of how much delay do you want to add into the junction and by by maintaining the kind of two lane approaches especially where you have a right turn across the junction it, it just helps uh, keep some capacity you know keeps maintain the capacity for, for vehicles through the junction so yeah we some of our uh, initial concepts that we kind of floated past the signals team the, 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 the traffic signals team at the county council we did kind of narrow down some of the carriageways to, to single lane approaches to the to some of the junctions and and kind of their comment back to us which uh, which was you know a valid comment was by doing that it's going to basically grind the place to a halt uh, and, cr and create unnecessary delay at the junctions. So we've we've considered that and uh, addressed it where necessary. OK, and yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at this thing and trying to come up with this kind of organised in my head. But um, so following on oh, what I would what I would say is that this junction is probably the most challenging. And in my mind, yeah, <laughs> we've, we've got some we've got concepts there, but there's a couple of things people have said that like for example how do cyclists turn right which I think is something that we still need to kind of fully answer and it's something I think will come back through this consultation process mm -hmm. and uh, yeah it'll be a slight challenge that we have to deal with going to Andy. Yeah and I was just going to add Paul Finley that Hills Road is a, is a high frequency bus route as well as, you know, mm. a busy pedestrian route, a busy site commute. There's a lot of uh, street users and it's trying to come up with a, something that helps everyone in what is quite constrained space. So we're, we're very conscious we're really targeting improving the infrastructure for pedestrians and cyclists. But we also need to be conscious that we can't introduce such um, severe measures that buses are, are really badly uh, affected by their journey times, particularly to things like Addenbrookes and the park and ride routes. So there is a balance to be struck in terms of, you know, all those competing uh, demands on the street. Yeah. And that and, has and had a bit of an influence on on how we've developed some of the designs in option A and option B. Yeah, I can see because if you put the cyclops in there, it becomes really skewed and weird and it's an odd thing. The one thing that just popped into my mind is Brookgate is a giant, really remarkably wide road when you actually look at it um, for the actually very limited amount of traffic that goes down it. I don't know if necking that down considerably buys you any space at least for maybe one of the one of the arms or one of the directions of cycle traffic um because it's kind of probably about three maybe even four lanes width actually when you look curb to curb and if tightening that up makes i, I don't i agree you're not going to get a perfect junction here because it's just a really weird shape unless you start taking land but i'm wondering if on that arm in particular necking down brookgate quite a lot could because it's basically just a few buses, it's buses that use that, I think, and maybe a couple of local access, but it isn't three lanes of traffic. So comment there. And also the islands are quite big. And if they're not being moved, I don't know if that changes stuff. But yeah, it's, it's a lot of permutations on this one that is challenging. Yeah, I, was just, I would just say on the Brookgate, and it, it is big, but buses do require a lot of space to track out of there. So it's, it's, it's mm. just making sure that if you do screw it down, that buses can still you know, safely make that left turn. They do sweep, take quite a big uh, wide sweep with double deck buses through there and the coaches. Thank you very much. Can I just um, comment on what you just said about the queuing southbound on Hills Road at that junction? You, you have actually reduced the right turn queuing lane quite significantly, the length of that. Do you think that will cause a lot of backup of traffic because the traffic that's stopped there waiting to turn right will be blocking the We'll still be, end up blocking the, for, the south going traffic. Andy? I think this is yeah, the balance. It's, it's the balance. It's, so, yeah. Yeah. so 
what we've tried to do there is get the cycle lane continuously up. Oh, to I the know, I like that. that. So. And by, um, it, by doing that, it takes a little bit away from that that queuing lane. Yeah, so it's trying to reach the right balance, really. And I guess, yeah, it depends on what how much traffic is going to be on Hills Road in the future. That will have a key influence as well on how well these junctions work. Okay, thank you very much. There is still a bit of time for people to ask questions. If you'd like to either put your hand up or post in the chat, I'll get to you. Um, whilst you're considering, if there's anything else you'd like to ask, um, there are a few kind of bits and pieces in the chat where people are commenting on scheme specifics. The way to sort of feedback on that would be to fill in the consultation survey, which is at the link um, that Paul uh, put up on his slide earlier on, which I'll ask him to just show again for a few seconds so that you've got the uh, got the address there. Um, we've got a bit of a, a chat going on about pavement parking and enforcement. Uh, just to reassure you, we can see the chat and we'll be able to have access to it after this meeting is ended. Um, I can see that Finley is typing. There are no further hands up at the moment. There. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, I I just <laughs> remembered. I just remembered something. Um, sorry. The new Cambridge GCP road classification that puts. Brook, uh, which one is it? Brooklands, Brookgate, the Brooklands Avenue. That puts Brooklands Avenue as a local access street, not as a through road. So, I mean, obviously, I guess this is a slight issue with all of these schemes being somewhat siloed from each other. But um, obviously, if that, if the plan for the GDP going forward, and this is, uh, I, I, is this still the current one? I don't know. Everything keeps changing, but. If that is still the current plan, then Brooklyn Avenue shouldn't have any through traffic, at which point you kind of have a bit more of a free for all in terms of that junction design. So, no, so, it, so under not, that plan, so Brooklyn's, plan. Brooklyn's Avenue uh, becomes kind of the route between the ring road and the station area. So, uh, this okay. junction becomes slightly more, well, it, it becomes slightly more important. Oh, okay. Because it, it said local access street, which I thought was kind of defined. I, well, it might just be that that map doesn't kind of provide the nuance. I think it's a green one on there, though, right? Which is local access. So is that not? I thought those were defined as not through traffic, basically. It's access. not. So it's not. So yeah. So under that road hierarchy, it's not through traffic, but it's access into the kind of the station area in and out. So what that that road hierarchy is looking to achieve is to create kind of single access points in and out of the city, isn't it? With a, yeah, with a, yeah, ring, yeah. a ring road that goes around, that follows the current ring road around kind of the outside of the city. Uh, okay, yeah, because the area, I mean, I think the area access streets I was understanding were kind of the, so you have your red routes there, which are your kind of trunk routes, it were, then the purple ones are kind of one below that, and then I kind of thought the greens were sort of feeders off of that, and. Yeah. Okay. Do, do, so, do we know if we were to, if this road hierarchy is implemented, what's the flow of Brook, flow of traffic on in and out of Brooklyn's road? So, where is that? Sure. What, so, this is know. this is one thing I covered earlier. So, the approach that we've taken is we we obviously have one eye on on what's happening with road hierarchy review yeah, of course. and on the, on the other thing that's happening so you know, the proposed congestion charge uh, but we don't know how that's going to end up congestion charge is a, is a big political decision then it's kind of outside of yeah it's outside of my I'm, I'm i'm well away from that project but i'm keeping one eye on kind of what's happening with it uh so as I said before, we are trying. So our our aim has been to try to present two options that can be implemented in the current environment, but also slightly modified or would also work with any future environment. I think that's fair to say, isn't it, Andy? That's yeah. been our challenge, really, and it is a challenge. It's it's really difficult to kind of reach that balance, but that that's kind of where we're at, and we have to. We have to keep progressing and keep moving these things forward. Otherwise, you know, we just grind to a halt. Uh, but but the That's challenge fair. is that you have lots of ideas floating around, you know, everywhere and a kind of a, a, a plan of of action for Cambridge. But, we've, we've, you know, we're, no one is 100 percent sure in terms of how that's all, all going to end up. So we've got to kind of keep one eye, one eye on it, but also. Plan for any eventuality. 
So this this does actually, to be fair, this would if I think just I guess a comms thing. If it had been communicated to us that the reason these two junctions look a bit weird is because there's some other quite big plans afoot that may or may not come and completely change the design requirements for them. I, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Like you don't, you know, if you if if this road hierarchy does come in, or the other or um other big roads get pedestrianised, then obviously that completely changes the requirements for how you design the junction. So yeah, so I guess it makes sense if you say that we're just leaving some kind of slight improvements here, but mostly blank slate, just so we can kind of come in and do it properly once everyone's worked out what the hell they're doing with the city. Then that yeah. kind of. So what I would say sense. is though that the, the Brook, so within all of that, the Brooklyn's Avenue Brookgate Junction is probably the most challenging for us to yeah. kind of. Uh, I think that's fair to say, isn't it? And it's the most challenging in that respect yeah. in terms of knowing what to do for, for now and for, for any potential future. The other two, so Station Road is, I mean, I quite like the design that that's, oh, yeah, that's, that's good. That's sort great. of semi cyclops for Station Road. A few people have commented, got some comments on it, but it kind of, for me, that, that works in any eventual scenario. Yeah. Uh, I think it's quite a good design. That's my personal opinion at the moment, and I look forward to hearing what people you know, people might raise things during this consultation process. And like likewise, neat, yeah. likewise, the other one at Cherry Hinton Road, that kind of also works in any future scenario. So the Brookgate one is is the most challenging. So I'm happy to have you know for people to feedback and have comments and and ideas you know uh, on that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, is there anything you want sorry. to add, Andy, to that? Sorry. Sorry, no, I was just going to add, um, Sarah Finney, I think, yeah, Brookgate Junction is proving a particular challenging junction to see how we can best balance all the competing movement demands through that junction, but still provide a very good, a much better quality facility for pedestrians and cyclists. I think this is the key kind of purpose of this engagement is to, you know, see if there's any, you know, uh, good ideas, some inspirational ideas from the public, from stakeholders of things that we may have not considered that junction that you think, you know, is an opportunity and then we can take that away and consider that further. So it's like I say, this is the key is this is a concept design stage and we can then, you know, gather all the feedback and review that and see if there's opportunities we can do um, further changes to that junction going forward. Yeah. Um, I think the, um, yeah, I agree. I just back up the fact that the other junction, the, the other ones where you have been the Cyclops or semi the Cyclops seem like there'd be a big improvement. The one I think I put in a chat somewhere, I probably got lost in all my other thoughts, was on um, the Cherry Hinton Road junction. Does Homerton Street need its own whole kind of arm of the Cyclops? Because it's kind of, it's a, again, that's very, very low traffic. So I'm wondering if a continuous footway might not be more suitable on that part of the, on that arm, because it's, I don't know, it's what maybe a more surface level car parking I think that's accessed by that um so you might even I mean rather than having a whole set of you know complex set of cyclops stuff on that arm you could potentially just do continuous footway across I don't know how, quite how that fits in with all the signaling but um it might not just be a whole formal arm of the junction I think that will be the challenge yeah having sort of part signalized part prior to control that might um to be a bit of a safety or sort of control issue around the whole junction we operate so but again yeah it's a good point and something we can look at in a bit more detail whether that is um what is the, the optimum solution but i think yeah if you're going signalization it needs to be on all arms and uh, all movements just okay. so it's consistent on all, all arms of the junction so it's uh, operates safely as a as a whole junction yeah i would agree with that i think on the signalized crossroads that that is definitely the case so we have got an example on milton road Elizabeth Way roundabout where the, ran, the roundabout is being signalised but the Highworth Avenue arm um, which is like likewise very low trafficked just a few residential uh, movements in and out that is not signalised but that's on a roundabout situation so it's very different uh, this is a kind mm. of more of a signalised crossroads so imagine if, if, if you're a driver coming out of there no signals Actually, I, I don't know how it would work. I don't quite know how it would work. Would work. I mean, we could look at it. It's it's, a, it's it's an idea we can look at and say that. But I, yeah, was, my first was, instinct is I'm not sure it would work. No, you'd, you'd you'd have to sit down and do some tables of how who would go when. It was more just thinking because that's such a low traffic exit there. It kind of feels like putting the footway and cycleway like across would be from a street space point of view at least would make a lot of logical sense because if you look at there's three big roads there. 
and one that's kind of tiny and has one car every 10 minutes so logically that from that point of view it makes sense but yeah from the signaling it's going to be might be a bit more, a bit more than on this call anyway thank, thank you very much for your input um, does anybody else have any uh, questions that they would like to raise doesn't look like it final call for questions please raise your hand now if you would like to ask something i can see a couple of heads being shaken I'll let you go have dinner. It's fine. <laughs> no, you can you can very much ask a question if you have further questions. <laughs> uh, can, can I thank you uh, all for um, your presentation and your answer? I I need to go now, but I I'd like to uh, thank you for the work uh, that you're doing and the care that you're putting into it. Um, um, but uh, I do remind uh, hope that you'll remember in your consideration for um, cyclists and pedestrians. And of course, it's very important that there are those of us now in the city who are too old to cycle and who cannot walk very far. And so who um, often need um, vehicles because buses don't go everywhere. Um, you know, so the car drivers are not necessarily villains. <laughs> They're just people who need to get around. <laughs> yeah. Um, but thank you all very much for what you're doing. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you, Janet. Thank, thank you for your questions and your valid, you know, the points you raised as well. Right. So, yes, thank you everybody for coming along this evening. Some good, uh, good questions and comments. If anything else should occur after this meeting, uh, you're very welcome to fill in the consultation survey. You're very welcome to come to the in-person event next week. Uh, we will also be running another one of these, which will follow the same format, same presentation with a QA, and a and that will be the week after next. Um, I'd like to thank Andy, Paul and Gregor, as well as Jay for their uh, input to this evening's meeting. Thank you all for your questions and uh, have a lovely evening.